Thank you for downloading the Outlook podcast. I'm Matthew Bannister. Today, the extraordinary story of the flying cowboy who delivers free health care to millions. Stan Brock was born in the UK, but always dreamed of being a cowboy. I asked him where his fascination with cowboys started. Well, probably at a Saturday morning matinee in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. What, uh, in the cinema? Yes, well, you know, watching Hoplong Cassidy and all that stuff. <laughs> and why did it strike a chord with you, more particularly than anybody else? I'd always been interested in adventure and um, read everything I could in the library in Bournemouth, particularly about the Amazon area. And so when the opportunity arose, I hopped on a boat called the SS Columbia out of Southampton and three weeks later docked in uh, Georgetown, British Guiana, the only British colony on the continent of South America. 17-year-old Stan quickly went to work for the Rupununi Development Company at their remote Dardanawa ranch near the border with Brazil. There were about 50,000 head of wild longhorn cattle that were um, running wild over this um, three million acres of tropical savannah and a couple thousand Mustang-type horses. And so you had, you had this kind of dream of being a, a cowboy. What was the reality like? Was it very different from the Hopalong Cassidy films? Oh, well, yes, very much so. We were all barefoot cowboys. In fact, although I've spent many, many years in the saddle, I can say that I've never ridden a horse except in my bare feet. We had to make our own saddles out of deer hide and plaited our own lassos out of raw hide. About 20 of us at a time would ride out onto the savannas, sleep under the trees, and early in the morning then we would fan out and start... Uh, driving these wild cattle towards the corral. And, and did you take to this naturally? As a lad from Bournemouth on the south coast of the United Kingdom, did you just um, uh, slip into it or, or did you you know, have to learn your trade? Oh, I very much had to learn the trade, yes. In fact, they gave me a very friendly horse that nobody else wanted to ride uh, because it wasn't the high-spirited horse that cowboys like to ride, uh, a, a horse that I call Butterball and uh, Butterball and I got along very well for a couple of years uh, while I learned the ropes, so to speak. And about two years later, they gave me another horse to ride, a horse called Kang, uh, which was the Wapishana Indian name for the devil because Kang had already killed two other cowboys. So we lassoed Kang in the corral uh, and strapped on my saddle and I climbed on board and we cut him loose and Kang went bucking across the savannah and had a head-on collision with the side of the corral, and I was very badly injured, and uh, they sort of scraped me off the ground, and one of the vaqueros said, well, the nearest doctor is 26 days on foot from here, which, of course, was that trail through the forest. Well, I was obviously in no condition to do that. What sort of injuries had you sustained, Stan? Oh, you know, most of my ribs broken. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's when I first had this idea that maybe we ought to bring these doctors a little bit closer than 26 days on foot. So Stan started taking flying lessons. Once he'd got his pilot's licence, he bought his own light plane so he could fly medical supplies to the remotest parts of Guyana. It was very easy to get pharmaceuticals in Georgetown in those days. And so, uh, although I didn't know anything about medicine, I got myself a few books and would load the airplane up with penicillin and stuff like that and start, you know, treating uh, minor injuries and so forth uh, and got rather good at it over a period of of some years. And, And why was it that you decided to do that? Because, you know, some people would have said, this is not my responsibility, but you took it on your own shoulders to try to help people. Why was that, Stan? Well, uh, you know, I was one of them. You know, I was just a kid when I went there, and so I sort of grew up with them, and I I spoke the language fluently, and I shared all kinds of uh, good times and bad times with them. Uh, And so when somebody got sick, I felt responsible to be able to at least try to provide some assistance, and and fortunately the airplane uh, made that possible. In those early days, uh, Stan, how did you pay for it all? Well... (laughs) The interesting thing was that um, the Rupununi Development Company, it was a a very well-respected company. And so I could walk into any store in Georgetown and point at stuff on the shelves and say, I'll take one of these and three of those and four of those. 
and I wouldn't have to pay for it. They'd send the bill over to the Rupununi Development Company office and somebody would make good the purchase. Um, and, and so this went on like that for many, many, many years until I finally left. Right. Uh, and and what what happened was that you became something of a TV star, I gather. When when did you first make your break into television? <laughs> well, after I'd been there many years, a fellow called Warren Gast, an American, showed up with a very heavy Aeroflex camera and a tripod. He said that somebody had told him that he should look for this chap, this English fellow, uh, Stan Brock, who would be able to take him out and show him where all the where all the wild animals were. And so Warren uh, stayed with me there, shooting all kinds of uh, stuff on the animals. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Uh, the typical animals of the region, of course, were the jaguar and the puma and the ocelot, and, uh, and then there were two or three types of deer uh, and tapirs. And then on the reptile side, of course, there was the giant anaconda. Stan decided to try to lasso the anaconda and drag it ashore. Got him! And had you any way of, did you have any way of watching that programme? No, none at all. No, right, we so, didn't even so have did you radio. have any, any sense, you didn't even have radio. So did you have any sense of the, the fact that you were becoming something of a household name in the United States? Absolutely none. Uh, and apparently, as I found out later, you know, about 33 million people were watching the program every Sunday night. <laughs> well, Stan's celebrity eventually led to him moving to America. But even though Hollywood beckoned, he wasn't interested in the silver screen. Instead, he wanted to expand his efforts to bring medical care to people in remote areas. He started to fly volunteer medical staff to many different developing countries. He called his operation Remote Area Medical, and it soon proved very popular. But one day, Stan got a surprising call. I think it was probably about 1990 that I got a call uh, from the mayor of a place called Sneedville, Tennessee, in Hancock County, uh, rated at the time as one of the poorest counties in America. And they said... Uh, you know, we hear that you go to Guatemala and Mexico and so forth. We just closed our hospital, and the only dentist that we had in town is left. Uh, do you think you could come up and, uh, and, and help out a little bit? And the main demand at the time was for dentistry. So uh, we loaded a heavy dental chair in the back of a pickup truck and drove up to uh, Sneedville, Tennessee, with a dentist. And there were about 150 people there waiting and so we fixed their teeth, and about a week or two later, I got a call from a mayor of another county uh, adjacent asking for the same thing. And uh, pretty soon we found that we were going somewhere every week in this part of Appalachia. And uh, now, uh, to date, we've done 893 of these events throughout the United States. And is it always in small communities, or do you do it in large cities as well? Oh, yeah, I, I, I've done them in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, we held a big event there at the Forum uh, several years ago and saw over 7,000 patients in a four-day period. My goodness, and do people come and queue up and, and wait in line? Yeah, sometimes for days. In fact, invariably for at least one day or two days, and they camp in their little tents, and uh, and it's really rather distressing to see these huge numbers of people uh, that simply cannot afford the system in this country. And are you shocked that the service that you intended to help people in countries that you might have thought were poverty-stricken is still needed in one of the richest countries in the world? Well, it is a shock, but I've been doing it for so long now. It's a way of life. I mean, two days ago, we did about 800 people in one location in Appalachia. And the week before that, we did 1,600 people in Baltimore, which is a large city in the United States, where we had set up 100 dental chairs and umpteen lanes of eye exam equipment and medical facilities. And so... 
wherever we go in the United States, people are going to come out of the woodwork. Uh, right. And, and you say you take the dental chairs and the eye exam equipment. Uh, so what level of care are you able to deliver to the people who queue up for so long to get your services? And we've got first-class equipment. Uh, over the years, we've accumulated 138 dental chairs and uh, the capacity to do a similar level of uh, optometry and ophthalmology with all the same equipment you would find at an ophthalmologist's office. We have a fleet of trucks. We've got seven donated airplanes, and, and now we're accumulating boats so that we're effective by land, sea, and air, so to speak, and still have that traditional parachute airdrop capability that I developed uh, many, many years ago for uh, places like... Uh, the upper Amazon. Mm. And do you have any idea how many American citizens you might have treated over the years? Well, it's, it's, it's coming up on a million, and uh, we've had over, a, oh, the last count, I think, over 114,000 volunteers uh, in the field. It's an incredible operation. It really is an incredible operation. I, I just wonder <laughs> what sort of reaction you get from the people who you do treat. Oh, it's wonderful to work with the patients. Uh, the patients are fantastic. Uh, they're so appreciative of the help that they get. You know, we, we set up private cubicles and so on, but um, uh, it gives an, a, a, a patient an opportunity to sit down with a specialist in whatever the issue is, diabetes or heart disease, etc., or women's health, and have a long discussion with the, uh, with the doctor uh, and, and the doctors care about the, about the patient. So when the patient gets out of the dental chair or comes out of the cubicle and puts their arms around the, the doctor or the assistant and thanks them, it's, it's a moving experience for everybody. And I suppose you've been very dedicated to this work for many years and that you've made some sacrifices. Am I right in thinking that you sleep in your office on a camp bed? Well, I don't have a camp bed. I sleep on the floor. This is not a, uh, a hardship for me, um, uh, you see, Matthew, because, remember, I essentially grew up with the Wapishana Indians, and so I'm used to going without food for a day, maybe two days if necessary, and not having electricity and sleeping on the ground. And so um, it's another opportunity that I have to be able to identify with the poor and the underserved here in the United States and overseas, of course, because I'm, I'm one of them. Mm. Um, I don't receive a salary for, for, for what we do here. I'm one of the many volunteers that do this uh, totally without compensation and happy to do that. Stan Brock, now 81 years old and still regularly riding a horse and flying planes. And if you liked this podcast, why don't you try another BBC World Service podcast? It's called The Documentary, and as you might have guessed, it brings you our very best documentaries, investigating, analysing and examining probably every topic you could ever think of, from the sad to the serious, the ordinary to the extraordinary. Fascinating, revealing and poignant. Please give The Documentary a listen.